Okay, everybody, um, time to start again. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Fabrizio Bassetti, who probably actually doesn't need introduction in this context. Um, he's obviously here at KAUST. He directs the Reactive Flow Research Lab. He received his PhD in uh, UC Berkeley 2007, where he worked with J.Y. Chen, I think mainly on PDF methods. Uh, and he then worked with uh, Heinz Pitch at Stanford for a number of years um, before joining uh, KAUST here. Um, I think his recent DNS has been extremely impressive, um, particularly his work with, um, with Soot, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this talk. Thank you, Evan. All right, so, well, welcome back after the refreshment. I'd like to start by, of course, acknowledging uh, my collaborators since, since the early beginning, and I think that has been a, a great, a great um, joint effort. And uh, I think the value, the value really of collaboration is mostly in the uh, continuous exchange of ideas and, uh, and questioning of each other's opinions. And I think in that, in that sense, that has worked out very well. Um, I want to, I, I, put, I decided to put this picture up because I think it really reminds us of, of two things in turbulence, which is one, scale separation, a wide range of scales, and two, the intermittent nature of gradients. And I, and I think that those are two key features that I hope you'll, you'll concur with me. And what I'll try to do here today is, is to provide three, three um, topics or, or, or delve into three topics. One is um, why does it matter? Why does it matter that we should be looking at high Reynolds number turbulent combustion configurations? Number two, uh, what have we started looking at? What are the statistics we've started looking at with the data sets that we have available? And three, which is a little bit of a far out uh, back of the envelope, envelope mathematics that I hope will, will, will convince us that we absolutely need high pressure if we want to investigate the physics of um, high Reynolds number turbulent flames. Okay, so um, let me just provide you some context as to why we're doing what we're doing. At CCRC, we've started a large scoped thrust um, towards high pressure and high Reynolds number flames. And the reason why we want to do that is because we want to investigate turbulent combustion at industrially relevant conditions. Now, industrially relevant conditions mean high pressure. And as a consequence, I would argue, uh, high Reynolds number flows. So the reason why uh, Reynolds numbers are high uh, has less to do with U and L, even though, of course, that has something to do with the high Reynolds numbers. But mostly, it has to do with the fact that the kinematic viscosity is inversely proportional to pressure. So that as the pressure goes up, the kinematic viscosity goes down, and the Reynolds number increases with pressure. Of course, as pressure increases, you end up having perhaps some important kinetics effects. But this is not the subject of the talk, um, or at least not primarily. Now, I would like to contra contrast this, and, and this is something that, of course, gets talked a lot, but, but I thought it would be nice to have it on a slide. The fact that we should contrast uh, the role of, of pressure in increasing the Reynolds number with what is typically done at one atmosphere. In a one atmosphere laboratory flame, typically L is small, and that's done primarily to conserve fuel because, of course, large physical dimensions means large areas, and that leads to significant fuel consumption. And so in order to get a high Reynolds, typically, we increase the velocity. And so because we are working with the, with, to the, towards the product of U times L, so that the Reynolds number increases. But the ratio of L to U is small, and it's, and it's artificially small compared to uh, realistic devices. Of course, we can get around that by changing the chemical timescales to try to match the, the reduced physical timescales of the system towards a, uh, a sped up uh, flame, in a way. Now, um, so at, at the risk of sounding very pedantic and stating the obvious, I'd like to go back to uh, the title of the Kolmogorov 1941 paper that, says that, that reads, the local structure of turbulence in an incompressible viscous fluid for very large Reynolds numbers. And whenever a mathematician tells you that it's a very large Reynolds number, not just a large Reynolds number, what they really mean is an infinite Reynolds number. Um, for the students in the audience, I'm sure that uh, those that have been around a little bit more know this by heart by now, that uh, this is the first paper where the two similarity hypotheses quantify the energy cascade in terms of similarity arguments. The Kolmogorov scales are introduced, the inertial range scaling is identified, and what's most important, I think, it's a clear statement of the fact that a turbulent flow is a flow with wide range, uh, wide, a wide range of scales. And uh, the Reynolds number is really a knob, right? It's a knob that is a measure of scale separation. Again, I'm not stating anything revolutionary. This has been known for a very long time. What perhaps gets overlooked often 
and it was overlooked by myself for quite some time during my uh, education, I guess, is that the hypothesis of K41 allow for important scaling arguments in the limit of infinite Reynolds number. Now, the point I'm trying to make, and hopefully I'll convince you of that, is that some of these arguments are technologically important. They're not just philosophical or, or uh, oddities that interest applied mathematicians. And my, my claim here is that the limit behavior of Reynolds going to infinity is often investigated, typically in the incompressible isothermal turbulence community, to clarify the ranges of applicability of the scaling. You have to see where the scaling does not apply to realize it doesn't apply, as well as to guide our understanding and design of experiments, because we can exploit some of these scalings to design more clever experiments. Now, what do I mean by, by scaling laws holding? So this is an example taken by a JFM paper that appeared in 2005 by Donzis and co-workers. And what you see here is what is typically called the dissipative anomaly for scalars in homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So the caveat is that we're looking at data that comes from homogeneous isotropic turbulence. This is incompressible, and the data pertains to passive scalar mixing. On the y-axis, you have the mean scalar dissipation rate. And the way that it's normalized is by L, an integral scale, U prime, a fluctuation, and the variance of the passive scalar fluctuation. The important thing to keep in mind is that those are viscosity independent velocity and length scales. And so they have nothing really to do with viscosity, hence they have nothing to do with Reynolds number. Those are, those are user defined and user specified scales. What do you notice? That as you plot this quantity normalized as a function of the Reynolds lambda, the Reynolds based on the Taylor microscale, at some point, the dependence, the dependence of this quantity on Reynolds goes away. Right? And the mean scalar dissipation rate normalized goes to an asymptotic constant. What that means is that now, just based on whatever you dial in in terms of your geometry, allows you to infer or to scale the scalar dissipation rate. Of course, the asymptotic value and where exactly you reach the asymptotic is configuration dependent. But that's obvious because you're using the large scales of the flow to normalize the mean scalar dissipation. So it makes sense that the constants that describe this asymptotic limit are uh, flow dependent. Now, in simple terms, uh, to recap, if the Reynolds number of the flow is large enough, the mean scalar dissipation rate does not depend on nu and gamma, Rather, it depends on the large scales of the flow, which is U prime L and the variance of the fluctuation of the passive scalar. Thus, the mean scalar dissipation rate is a function of U prime L and the variance. And those are, again, device parameters. Those are things that you dial in by deciding how big your burner is or how much flow rate you're, you're going to flow through. And so this is something that the experimentalist, as well as the, uh, whoever designs the DNS, has a control on. Now, of course, if, if the story ended here, we would be done with turbulence. Uh, of course, the statements above in terms of scaling does not, do not say anything about the fluctuations of the scalar dissipation rate about its mean. We know very well that the variance of the fluctuations of the scalar dissipation rate increase with Reynolds. So now you have this beautiful situation where you can design your experiment, your experiment to keep the, scalar, the mean scalar dissipation rate constant and yet dial in by varying the Reynolds the uh, extent of the fluctuations so of the scalar dissipation rate. And this is something we all ought to do. Uh, we could answer questions such as, are the behavior and statistics of key quantities in turbulent flames, either non-premixed or perhaps stratified, governed by the mean scalar dissipation rate or by rare events with excursions of the scalar dissipation rate much, much greater than the mean, which we know for sure are occurring in intermittent flows, or perhaps by both, but in different ways. And probably the answer is it depends on the quantity that you're looking at. And I think we've already seen some of this in the scaling of NOx, which perhaps is more sensitive to large scales, and, and the scaling of extinction, which is, of course, more sensitive to excursions, localized extinction, which is more sensitive to excursions of the scalar dissipation rate. Now, my claim is that um, the measurement of these scaling statistics or quantities that give you a grip and give you a handle on scaling of turbulent flames are very difficult in flames. And uh, advances in high performance computing for turbulent reactive flows, I think, has promoted a renewed interest in the scaling behavior of statistics in turbulent flames. And I think that right now we are at a situation where for selected configurations, we're starting to enter the region where the asymptotic limit of that graph that I've showed you before perhaps is gonna apply. And I think we have a real opportunity to investigate and address fundamental questions. 
Again, DNS offers statistics of key quantities which are otherwise very difficult or outright impossible to obtain. Now, some recent examples of work that I, I look up to, and I think it's, it, it's, it's in the right direction, is the work by Kolla and co-workers, and we have here Evett, as well as the earlier work by Knaus and Pantano. And in both of these works, it's very clear that what the authors are trying to do, they're trying to figure out, based on scaling arguments, the similarities between uh, turbulent flames and, and what we know in fundamental turbulence for incompressible flows. And I think we, we should do a lot more of that. Now, what we've done here at KAUST, we've developed a comprehensive framework for the simulation of turbulent combustion. We have focused on, on soot formation, but it turns out that the framework that we have is, uh, is very useful to look at more fundamental questions as well. We base the solution of the reactive Navier-Stokes equations on the Lomach number treatment we've heard uh, with methods that are very similar to what John Bell um, explained today. We've done one simulation with more than 3 billion uh, grid points. This was our first large-scale simulation solving for five fields. This was incompressible turbulence in a spatially developing mixing layer, which actually opened my eyes at least to a number of issues. And finally, we ran also four simulations, which are 500 million grid points, but they feature 52 fields, so there's very, very large calculations. We've used about 150 million CPU hours on, on Shaheen, and of course, we've been very lucky to have that at our disposal. Most of those are run at core counts, which exceed 30,000. Okay, my, my, my movie here, uh, the configuration that I'm going to be showing you statistics for is a what's called a temporally evolving planar jet flame. Here you see uh, surfaces of the mixture fraction, different colors corresponding to different values of the mixture fraction. The configuration features a fuel, a fuel jet that is flowing upstream as well as two uh, counterflowing um, air streams that are flowing downstream. The, the core is initialized with channel, um, channel turbulence. Um, and, of course, the high shear at the interface generates Kelvin Helmholtz, triggers the Kelvin Helmholtz instability, and from then on, the, 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 the flame evolves towards a turbulent flame. Now, the specifications, this is 500 million grid points, as mentioned. We use finite rate chemistry with 47 species. We evolved everything up to 20 milliseconds. I will show you statistics at 15 milliseconds. Reynolds lambda is about 100. Of course, it's not constant across the, the flame itself, so it's kind of hard to give you a hard number, but it's about 100, which, which on the Donzis diagram would place you sort of a, for homogeneous isotropic turbulence, but it turns out that the cutoff where the asymptotic behavior kicks in is relatively flow independent. Um, that the 100 would place you right at where you're starting to observe some, some, some significant and well-defined asymptotic behavior. Now, we have looked at soot chemistry turbulence interaction, and we've done three simulations for, with varying damp color number and constant Reynolds number. But today, I'm going to present statistics from the high damp color number case with, um, with and without, with, with two different, uh, with two different uh, diffusion models. One that is a fully, with, it's a full transport with mixture average properties, and the other is a unit Lewis number. So to recap, we have many simulations, but today I'm going to present statistics from the simulation with the high damp color number limit. So the one that is closest to the infinitely fast chemistry limit, if you will. Um, the details are in these publications, and uh, of course, you're more than, than, than welcome to email me or Antonio to ask uh, further questions about how we actually did this in, in practice and in details. So the time evolution of the flame, here you see snapshots of the temperature field at 5, 10, and 20 milliseconds. The fuel jet is in the middle, is surrounded by air. You notice immediately that the air is actually preheated at 800 Kelvin. The fuel is nitrogen with an heptane. It's, it's a very uh, highly diluted um, uh, fuel stream where uh, the nitrogen is 85% and the remaining, the balancing is, is enheptane. And uh, what you can clearly see here is that by 10 milliseconds, and I show you statistics, the, the, uh, the Kelvin Helmholtz instability that is triggered by the strong shear across the interface has actually um, reached a, a state that we can call the turbulence that we observe in, in the middle of the jet, we can call that a fully developed turbulent flow. It turns out that this is not self-similar. So this corresponds in a way to the near field of a um, slot, a slot turbulent uh, flame. So again, not self-similar, but turbulence has, 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 is, is developed. Okay, so uh, the velocity statistics, the jet, the jet spreads as time progresses, going from 5, 10, 15, in 20 milliseconds, what you notice here that convinces you that this is the near field, really, is that the velocity at the center line hasn't dropped much. So what we're really looking at is, the again, the near field of a flame. 
And the flame, to, to a certain extent, behaves like a mixing layer in a way, right? whereby it's really s stuck between if, uh, two streams with a, with a, with a, with a, uh, with a delta in, in the velocity. Uh, we start with this, what you're looking at here is the RMS of the streamwise velocity. And what you see here, we start at five milliseconds with, uh, with, with variance, localized more or less. This is normalized by the jet width, so y over h equal 0.5 would mean you are right where the initial jet width is, so you are at the interface. So, um, you, have, you have strong shear and hence um, significant, uh, significant fluctuations. Then if you go further, the peak increases, more fluctuations, and it's moving outward consistently with the jet spreading. You go to 15, this trend continues, and then to 20, it's, it's even further. Now, what you notice here is that the peak is significantly higher than, than the centerline velocity, which tells you again that we are in the near field of a flame, not in the, uh, f not on the, f not, not in the uh, fully developed and self-similar region of the jet, where you would expect that the peak and the mean are, are of comparable magnitudes. Same story for the fluctuation of the mixture fraction. Now, here's the scalar dissipation rate. It's the mean scalar dissipation rate condition of mixture fraction. This is close to the initial laminar solution at 5 milliseconds. The vertical line um, uh, indicates the stoichiometric contour. As time progresses, the scalar dissipation rate increases. Um, it, it then decreases a little bit, and then it settles in at 20 milliseconds with this particular shape. You notice, in fact, that the, the peak is not at 0.5. It's shifted towards the left. And if you, if you want some numbers, the uh, value of the scalar dissipation rate for um, the value of the scalar dissipation rate at stoichiometry never really exceeds on the mean, of course, about, 20, about uh, 25. And that's important because, again, for the case at hand where the mean scalar dissipation rate does not exceed 25, that number should be contrasted with the extinction strain for the streams, and that's about 250. So it's clear that, that we, this is a healthy burning flame uh, in, in the high down color number limit. Okay, I've mentioned this already. So how do we tell that, uh, that we have what we can consider turbulence? Well, we look at the PDF of the scalar dissipation rate. Uh, of course, uh, due to finite resolution, we're certainly missing the, the, the tails of the scalar dissipation. But what you can clearly see, though, is that as time progresses, the the variance of the, of the PDF of the scalar dissipation rate becomes broader. And that's a clear indication that, that we have transitioned to uh, a, fully, a fully mature turbulence, as we'd like to, to call it. And as time progresses, this trend, this trend continues. What's of course interesting that now you have also very low values of scalar dissipation rate, which, which is something that in a way tends to be uh, maybe discussed less as the presence of, of very high values. Okay. Um, so now, based on the data, I'm going to show two uh, important statistics. And I think they are important because, and again, those, this is very, very new data, and we're in the process now of writing it up and submitting it. The reason why I'm going to be showing you these two statistics is because I think that we can, we can start seeing in, this in, in selected statistics some of the limits of what uh, a turbulent flame should do. For example, uh, it should be independent of the molecular diffusion model. Uh, and uh, some, and it should behave a little bit more like an incompressible flow, especially a non-premixed flame, where as the Reynolds number becomes higher, the flame sheet becomes smaller and smaller and occupies less and less space in, in the overall uh, space occupied by the flame. So heat release rate should matter less and less. Okay, uh, so let's start with the alignment statistics. Just to remind everybody, we start with the instantaneous strain rate tensor, what you can do is you can, um, you can decompose that, uh, in the, you can do a decomposition to get the principal strains, the eigenvalues. We're here using the notation where alpha is greater than beta and greater than gamma. And the directions here are, are indicated as follows. I'm going to be mixing back and forth between eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Depending on the context, it should be fairly obvious what we're talking about. Now, I'm, we're going to be looking at the alignment of the of the various um, eigenvectors, the various principal directions of the strain, with other vectors. And two vectors come to mind, of course, and it's classically done, the vorticity as well as the scalar gradient. We're also, gonna, we're also going to do this with a, with a reactive uh, scalar, the temperature, and, and see and contrast perhaps the differences. So we start with the PDF of the strain rate eigenvalues. This is alpha, the most extensive um, eigenvalue. You can notice that it's positive. It has broad tails. So you would expect that because this is calculated directly from the gradients of the velocity. 
And so the gradient of the velocity display intermittent behavior. And what you notice is that there is some dependence on the conditioning value of z, but, but it, it, it doesn't, the conditioning value of z does not change, does not change the PDF tremendously. Um, you, we can then go to the intermediate um, strain beta. This is centered um, around zero. Uh, we'll see that the most probable value in is in fact one. And then we can go to the most compressive one, which is gamma, and again, you see a similar story. Uh, you don't get um, negative, uh, positive values of gamma, you do get some slightly negative values of alpha. Now what's interesting is that then we went back to whatever we could find in the literature and we compared the, in the, in the present non-premixed flame, we compared the values of the most probable alpha, beta, and gamma, so the, the three strain rate eigenvalues, to measurements by, by Mirko and, and, and Noll. And, um, and in fact, we recover exactly the same ratios. And, and I think this is just confirms that, that we're doing things properly. Now we can now look at the alignment statistics and uh, how do we create the alignment, the alignment statistics? What we do is, what's plotted here is the cosine of the angle between whatever uh, direction we're looking at with the vorticity vector. Here plotted, so when, when the cosine is one, that indicates zero degrees, so we call that a perfect alignment. When the cosine is zero, we get a 90 degrees, that means that the two are at 90 degrees with each other. Because this is a PDF, this is telling you that vorticity with respect to the beta is mostly aligned. Okay? The other thing that we found, in fact, is that there is very little uh, pre preference of vorticity. Uh, there is no preferred angle, really, of the alignment of vorticity and, and alpha. And this is important because in previous work, it has been shown that uh, vorticity would align preferentially with alpha. And so you would expect actually that this, this, all these values would actually go this way. This was shown in simulations, but these were at remarkably low Reynolds number, um, Reynolds number turbulent flames. And so perhaps, and we're not sure, uh, this could be a, an indication that, that um, the Reynolds number, at least for alignment statistics, does have an impact. And the last one is gamma where you can see that the alignment is, is perpendicular to the vorticity. What you notice here, those are multiple lines, and those are multiple lines, and the lines here indicate mixture fraction. So it means that the alignment statistics between vorticity and, and, the, and the principal uh, strains do not change depending on the conditioning value of mixture fraction, which we take as a distance from the flame. And again, this goes in the direction of saying, well, if the Reynolds is high enough, the flame is thin enough, and it doesn't actually change through heat release rate the alignment statistics. Now, these symbols that you see here are data from homogeneous isotropic turbulence. And so it's actually remarkable that, that the alignment statistics are, 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 are the same. Okay, uh, we can then look at the alignment of the gradient of Z and the strains. And this is, again, is important. Z is the passive scalar. We need to consider its alignment with the strains. We start with gamma. And what you can clearly see here um, is again an alignment of gamma, again one means alignment of zero degrees, an alignment of gamma with the gradient of mixture fraction. You see a 90 degrees with respect to the intermediate strain, and you see the classic 45 degrees alignment with the extensive strain, which again is a large scale feature, reason being that this is a, this is a sheared flow. Right? If we now superimpose homogeneous isotropic turbulence, you see, in fact, that the alignments hold for gamma and beta, they don't hold for alpha. And you could, would kind of expect that because, again, our configuration is a sheared flow with mean gradients, whereas in the case of homogeneous isotropic turbulence, there aren't such mean gradients. Um, another thing is uh, we, you can then look at the alignment of the gradient of temperature. And what I'm, what I'm plotting here is exactly what I was plotting before, only that now, the symbols are the alignment statistics of the passive scalar with the principal strain. And what you can clearly see is that there is really no difference between the alignment of temperature and the alignment of mixture fraction. And again, in the high dam color number limit, you would expect this because, of course, uh, the majority of space is dominated by mixing and with a linear relation between temperature and mixture fraction and not by chemistry. Right. Okay. Um, so we observed that alignment of statistics are independent of the conditioning value of mixture fraction. The statistics of the alignment of vorticity and principal strain match those in homogeneous isotropic turbulence. This is in contrast with the only available result we could find from direct numerical simulation. 
the alignment of the gradient of z and the gradient of t with the principal strain is identical. And of course, it's a big caveat. This is not so in premixed flames, and you would expect that, uh, because again, uh, in, in, uh, from its work from uh, Chakraborty, right? And these findings are consistent with the idea that non-premixed flames are confined to a small portion of the flow for the high Reynolds numbers. Now, I'm going to move on now to uh, Lewis number effects in turbulent non-premixed flames. We have run the same simulation with two models. The first one is a mixture average model, which I, I may refer to as full transport. The other one is a Lewis uh, number one model, which I may refer to as unity Lewis number. Again, where the diffusivity of all species is assumed to be equal to the thermal diffusion. Now, here is a comparison, which I think it's, uh, it's probably the, the, most the most important takeaway message. What you're looking at is the mean temperature plotted as a function of the uh, crosswise direction. Uh, my apologies here, the crosswise direction is indicated with x and not normalized before it was indicated with y, but this is the uh, crosswise direction. And what you can clearly see is that the symbols that indicate mixture average and those that indicate Lewis one fall on top of each other for any kind of uh, time evolution. Uh, the same thing is true for the fluctuations. So what that means is that there is literally and virtually no difference between, between the, two, uh, the two results, irrespective of the diffusion model. Now, if we now look at the conditional statistics of temperature, you're looking at the conditional mean of the temperature, condition on Z, and again, here's the flame sheet, and the two symbols are the mixture average and Lewis 1 simulations. The symbols lie on top of each other. What we can do then is to go back to a counterflow one-dimensional solution, solve it with full transport, and solve it with Lewis 1 approximation. And what you see here is that the Lewis 1 solution lies right on top of the conditional uh, statistics. The counterflow simulation is performed at the scalar dissipation rate at stoichiometry, which matches the conditional scalar dissipation rate at stoichiometry from the DNS. Um, in the con what, what we can also conclude from this comparison for one flame and one fuel under certain configurations, so this is of course again very preliminary results, is that if, if you compare to the solution for, for mixture average, the flame solution for mixture average, this is grossly inaccurate. Okay, so from a modeling perspective, and again, this is sort of, uh, this has been uh, talked about over and over again in the context of the TNS workshop, so what I'm saying is not revolutionary. What I think is important is that this has been shown in a situation where the agreement between the Lewis-1 flamlet and the conditional statistics is beyond any doubt that one may have for chemistry. So typically we would have to compare these results to uh, experimental results, but then the question is, um, is, the, is, the, is the LES capturing or are the, modeli, the model capturing turbulent chemistry interaction as well? Is the chemistry adequate? So I think this is, this is a very important result. Uh, what's also interesting is that these trends are time dependent. So what you're looking at is the temp conditional temp the temperature, the mean temperature conditional mixture fraction. And what you're seeing here is the time evolution from 5, 10, 15, and 20 milliseconds. And what you can clearly see is that the two line, again, the mixture average and the Lewis 1 models, tend to overlap more and more as time progresses. And that tells us, especially they don't agree all that well at 5 milliseconds, which is, again, when turbulence is extremely young and the flame is transitional, really. So as you go further downstream, um, the two tend to overlap more and more. And notice that there is no difference between 15 and 20, so any residual difference were not, uh, maybe just due to the physics of the problem. There are differences, and one is that this difference is the conditional mean doubly condition, the conditional mean of temperature doubly conditioned on Z and chi. And what you're looking at again is the chi on the X axis, and the Z conditioning Z is pretty much the mixture fraction, is the stoichiometric mixture fraction. The symbols here are conditional averages with respect to the conditioning value of scalar dissipation rate. And what you can clearly see is that the two agree very well for very low values of scalar dissipation rate, which, which again makes sense because since the low values of scalar dissipation rate are the most probable, then of course the spatial statistics will be biased towards those. And so it makes sense that the spatial statistics told you that the model doesn't make a difference. And so the conditional statistics for low values of chi don't show you the same. There is a difference, however, in the extinction behavior. Um, closer and closer to extinction, the two models give different, different results. Uh, if you now plot on top the value for the counterflow simulations, you see here the, sorry, this is a typo. This should be the Lewis-1 solution in, in solid. 
and the newest one solution in, uh, in Dashed. And you can clearly see that, that um, not only the two are similar, the conditional statistics from the DNS are similar, but the Lewis one solution is actually much more representative of, of what's actually occurring in the DNS. Now, again, there are other, co there are other quantities that don't, don't follow these this, 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 this conclusions. And one of those is naphthalene, which we have in the DNS because we wanted to study soot formation. This is a low dump color number species. So it's a species that, in a way, is spread over a much broader uh, portion of space because of its low dump color, um, dump, low dump color um, character. And perhaps as a consequence, uh, we see that the two models don't provide the same value. Another explanation, of course, is the fact that, that A2 has, um, has a, of course, an effective Lewis number that is quite large. This is a bulky molecule. And uh, perhaps that has to do with it. And the final thing is that because the asymptotic limit of, of, of scalar mixing is a function of the Schmidt number, uh, it's possible that while we do reach, a, 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 we start seeing an asymptotic limit for or turbulence behavior independent of viscosity for temperature, we don't see that for, um, for A2, which is further out in the Schmidt number values. Um, you can see this also very clearly if you look at the PDF of A2, the PDF of naphthalene, conditional mixture fraction. So the red is the mixture average model, and the blue is the, um, is the Lewis one model. First of all, there is, there is significant, uh, significant dependence of the PDF with respect to the conditioning Z. That's statement number one. And statement number two is that the mixture average um, generates a field that has much finer structures. And you can clearly see that with the excursions of the, of the A2 PDF towards higher values of A2. OK, so I'll skip the observation, which I've already made, and, uh, and then just present the my naive scaling statement, which, Bo, uh, which Bill alluded to during his presentation. And my question is, uh, a scaling is, is possible, and the scaling is just a hypothesis. Now, whether the scaling is useful, well, that's, that's a whole other story. So we can make a statement, and perhaps experimentalists and DNS people can work together to verify whether some of these scaling arguments, in fact, make any sense at all. So here's my naive scaling statement. We're going to start by defining a large-scale large dumb-color number, which is L over U divided by tau. Tau is, is a scale, is a time scale which you could take as the inverse of the extinction of the strain rate at extinction. Uh, the Reynolds number is defined as UL time divided by nu. Now, if you take a turbulent non-premixed flame as a base case, and of course the Sandia flame D comes to mind, you can, you can easily show, and again, this is just uh, back of the envelope math, nothing, nothing fancy there you can show that the ratio of u over u naught and l over l naught, where u naught and l naught are the length and, and velocity scales of whatever we call the base case, again, say Sandia flame D, and u and l are whatever we aspire to, scales as follows. Uh, notice important groups is the Reynolds, the ratio of the dumb color numbers, the ratio of the kinematic viscosities, and the ratios of the time scales. Now, caveat, again, even though the above statement is correct, Applying this scaling is, of course, no guarantee of obtaining two quote-unquote similar flames. I mean, the scaling could just fall on its nose, and the scaling is just missing some, some fundamental, some fundamental uh, physics. Now, of course, this is a scaling that, that, in a way, assumes that it's the mean scalar dissipation rate that controls the behavior of the flame, right? Now, um, Reynolds, heat transfer, all these effects could be important. Nonetheless, again, the statement in homogeneous entropy terms of, on the scaling of the scalar dissipation rate is a helpful statement. Now, if we assume that the power consumption that you have in your lab scales as the velocity times the length square times the density, which is really a mass flux, right, multiplied then by some, some uh, heat release associated with a kilo of fuel, uh, then what you can do is you can now substitute u over u naught, l over u, l naught, and you end up with this formula, which, which is frightening in a way. Why? Well, let's assume we want to do Sandia flame D at a higher Reynolds number. What we're going to do is we're going to keep the dumb color number constant because we don't want to complicate our life and we don't want to extinguish the flame. Now, if you do that, and perhaps you use the same identical streams because you do this at atmospheric pressure, and the densities are going to be the same, uh, the taus are going to be the same under the assumption that if I keep dumb color number constant, I'm not going to be changing the flame, then you end up with a dependence on the Reynolds to the 3 halves. So say that you want to increase the Reynolds by a factor of 10, you end up with 30 times more power that you need, which means 30 times more fuel that you need to burn. 
But of course, the equation also tells you good news because it tells you that decreasing nu to counteract the effect of increasing Reynolds and as well as um, decreasing the density, perhaps by preheating the streams, and decreasing tau especially helps. And to do so, you need to change the streams and change the pressure. Now, of course, w even if we decide to keep the same temperatures for the streams, we may, decide to, um, we, may decide, we may decide to increase the pressure. As the pressure increases, that tends to offset the effect of the Reynolds. That's statement number one. And statement number two is that as the pressure changes, tau may change and help us a little bit more. Because as pressure increases, you may expect that tau, the chemical time scale, decreases. And as a consequence, that helps us uh, achieve the same higher Reynolds number with a slightly smaller flame that hence has a little bit of a faster time scale that it should have. But that's offset by the fact that as pressure increases, the flame gets stronger. Okay? So I'll, uh, I'll perhaps in the interest of time, I'll skip. I'll skip uh, so the question obviously, obviously is, what do I prescribe as the dependence of tau with respect to pressure? And of course, you need to go in the literature, figure out whether chemical kinetic mechanisms are good enough to predict the scaling of methane with pressure. You need to do that in a counterflow. So this is an important statement to those doing counterflows at pressure. I think this is an extremely important uh, exercise and one that, that I, I think will, will uh, and one that we'll see more and more of. So I'll, I'll skip this and just conclude with this graph, which is the fact that, so once you put it all together, we've done some, uh, some uh, um, Flemlet calculations at increasing pressure and figured out what is that scaling of tau with pressure according to GRI MAC. We have validated GRI MAC against some old data by Chelaya and Law that show a, uh, a pressure to the 0.45 dependence of the extinction strain rate with respect to pressure between one and two atmospheres. We have extrapolated that all the way to 10 atmospheres. Big extrapolation. Uh, what you see here is the power consumption if you were to rescale flame D with the same dumb color and a higher Reynolds number. So the objective is to have a flame that is a 200,000 Reynolds number and the dumb color is the same. And I've just picked flame D as an example. But we could be doing this for many other flames. And uh, if you did the same experiment at one atmosphere, the f you would recover this 30 times more power that you need. But as you increase the pressure, the power requirements decrease, decrease very rapidly. And so if you do the experiments at 10 atmospheres, you end up with just about a factor of five power consumption, more than the flame you started from. Of course, those are numbers. So I could have plotted simply a P over P naught. But I just wanted to provide some sense of, of what these are. What's interesting is that if you do this, uh, the velocities that you need to achieve the higher Reynolds number drop. And that makes perfect sense. The flame is becoming slower. Uh, and as well as the, the size of the nozzles, it again, for Sandia Flame D, doesn't change all that much. Um, uh, you would have had to have a, a ridiculously large nozzle for if you do this at one atmosphere, but if you do this at 10 atmospheres, you end up with a nozzle that is about five millimeters. And again, that's, that's, that's manageable. Okay, so with that, I, I, I would like to conclude and uh, just, just argue that what we've been thinking for for the past several years now that simple scaling, the simple scaling that I presented underlies an intriguing question. The intriguing question is obvious, it has been discussed, it has been forgotten, it has been rediscovered, but has not been investigated experimentally yet, which is how does a turbulent non premix flame respond to variation in Reynolds number at constant damp color? Now, back of the envelope math shows that if one is to address this question, pressurized flames are a must, and, but we knew this already because technical devices operate at pressure. And so it's obvious that, that uh, we're sort of reinventing the wheel, and we need to do this at pressure to, to access more realistic, um, more realistic um, configurations.